Well, good morning, friends. Uh, my name is Erin, and I am one of the pastors on staff here at New Life. And as always, it is an honor and a privilege to open up the Word of God with you this morning. But before we do, I have a fun personal update I want to share. Uh, I recently found out that I've been invited to participate uh, through my seminary, through my graduate school, on a trip uh, doing the Camino de Santiago this summer in Spain. So I don't know if you're familiar, some of you might be, but the Camino is a network of pilgrim routes that stretch across Europe, and they all end in a town called Camino de Santiago. Uh, I'm sorry, Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain. And so it's estimated that about maybe like 350,000 people do this pilgrimage trip each year. And they usually walk somewhere between 10 to 18 miles a day from town to town. Some people do it alone. Some people do it uh, with a group. But for many people, it's really a very spiritually reflective time of prayer and spiritual growth with God. So for my group, we're going to be starting around the Portugal-Spain border. We're going to be going north along the coast about 90 miles over 10 days. So I'm really excited for this trip that I'll be taking this summer to travel the Camino. And uh, part of what makes it really special is actually that I have a group of fellow students at Fuller that I meet with uh, every other week for what we call uh, group spiritual direction. And it's really a time where we pray for one another, we listen to God on behalf of one another, and we support one another. And the majority of my group, the four or five of us, are going on this trip together. So a lot of these people that I've met with virtually for over a year, we're going to get to meet up in person in Europe for a new journey together. So uh, I'm beginning to train now to be able to walk these long distances. So if anybody has any good training tips or if you've walked the Camino before, I would absolutely love to hear your experience. I did learn a lesson yesterday. Uh, my plan was to walk six miles. And when I got three miles away from home, it started to rain. And I ended up having to call my husband to pick me up at about mile five. So I got in five miles instead of six, but it's a start. And I learned, always double check the weather or uh, bring a poncho. So all right, I'm already, I'm already training, I'm already learning. Um, <laughs> so anyway, today we're continuing on in our series forging friendships, building relationships that last. And I'll be honest with you that when I was asked to preach in this series, I felt a little nervous because if I'm being honest with myself and with God, there are a lot of times in my own life that I do not feel like the model friend I don't always pick out the best gifts. I know we always have some friends that are great gift givers. It's not usually me. Um, I don't have as much time as I would like to keep up with all of my new friends. And I don't always know what to say when a friend is in pain. So I'll be honest that I feel like I need a good sermon series on friendship just as much as anyone else does. Uh, so if you're feeling kind of like that in this season of your life, if you're feeling like, gosh, I'm just barely treading water with everything I already have going on, I can't even consider friendship. Or if you're feeling like, I'd love to have more friends, but I'm waiting on God to bring friends into my life. Or maybe you have some good friends, but you have a friendship or two that might be in need of an honest conversation, of maybe an apology or some reconciliation. Or maybe you're recovering from a recent or not so recent loss of a good friend and friendship just doesn't feel the same right now. Wherever you are with friendships in your life right now, I want you to know that there is hope for you, for us, in our friendships. That we can be hopeful and trust in God for deeper friendships to come and we don't have to feel like it's all up to us to make it happen. And I believe that the gospel hope that we hold in Jesus is also a hope for our friendships. We believe that God created friendships as good, 
and that God designed us for friendships and that God restores broken friendships. The truth of Jesus is good news for us and good news for our friendships. And I love this series because we might not always stop to consider that friendship is something God designed. This good thing that God made that he wants us to be able to take part in. And even if we had considered that, it can be really difficult to nurture and cultivate good, meaningful friendships in our lives. And so this series really takes a look at what the Bible has to say about friendships. And Pastor Ryan kicked us off a few weeks ago with a message about how all our friendships start with Jesus. And how it's out of our relationship with God that we overflow God's love into our friendships. And then last week, Pastor Juno talked about how we carry one another to Jesus. How we can't do life alone. But we need one another to lean on and to remind each other of the goodness and grace and mercy of God. And so as we continue on in this series today, we are going to be talking specifically about how God uses friendships in our lives. How God can use our good friendships with others as formative parts of our story. And it reminds me of the truth out of this book of Proverbs, which says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And when I hear this verse, I have this mental picture of like a knife or a sword being sharpened by another. And how a single knife can't get sharpened on its own, but it needs something else there to sharpen it. And in the same way, we need others in our lives to mold and shape and sharpen us. And so as we begin this morning, I want to invite you to reflect on your own life. Think of your life as one big story from the beginning when you were born to the chapter you're in now. Maybe you'd say you're in chapter 7. Maybe you'd say you're in chapter 22. However you would timeline and characterize your own story, I want you to reflect specifically on the friendships you've had over the years. Which friendships come to mind as the friendships that have had the deepest impact on you? Or to use that biblical term to sharpen you, to form you into who you are right now. Can you think of a friend or a person who has influenced you to be a better person? To be more generous, more kind, more understanding, more empathetic person? Well, today we're going to be looking at a story in scripture where God used an unlikely friendship to shape and mold a person's life. And how God brought two friends together for the purposes of his mission in the world. And how this friendship not only served a purpose in God's larger story, but also how it allowed one person to form and shape and sharpen another into the person God was calling them to be. So today we're going to be looking at the story of two prophets in the Old Testament named Elijah and Elisha. So I'm going to try to enunciate very clearly throughout this story. (laughs) Otherwise, it's going to be very confusing. So our story starts with Elijah, with a J, who ends up being a mentor and a friend to Elisha, with an S-H. So this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, because if anyone ever tries to tell me that the Bible is boring, I'd probably point them here. So this story has it all. It has adventure and humor and action and drama. And the story spans several chapters. And don't worry, we're not going to go through it all today because I know you want to get home uh, for lunch. So uh, we're not going to go through it all word for word, but I'm going to give you the summary version of parts of it. But I would definitely encourage you to go back and read it in its entirety later because it's a very dramatic story and it's very interesting and it's worth it. And it starts in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, and we're going to end in the book of 2 Kings chapter 2. And so this story of Elijah and Elisha is set inside this much bigger story of God's redemption and history of his people. 
So this story isn't just about friendship between these two prophets. It's really about God's history and how he brings healing and restoration. But it's interesting that we find this friendship between these two prophets in this small friendship story in the context of God's bigger story. Uh, But before we get to the story, would you pray with me? God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for who you've made us to be and the friends you've given us to walk with along the way. Thank you for those biblical stories you give us to learn more about you and the world you've created. And God, would you meet us here this morning and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we find the beginning of our story in the book of 1 Kings. And the kingdom here is in the middle of a season of really bad kings who are making some really bad decisions. So they're worshiping idols, and there's a lot of famine and drought, and the powers that be are really no longer following the true God. They're worshiping idols, they're ruling very poorly, and because of the poor rule, there's very little food and water, and the people are suffering And then Elijah comes on the scene as God's messenger. And one of the first things we witness Elijah do is he goes into the wilderness at God's command, and he sees God do some pretty cool miracles there. And then in the next chapter, Elijah leaves the wilderness, and he goes to the king. And he challenges the king publicly. So he challenges the king's false god specifically, and And everyone else that these idols are worshiping, I'm sorry, he challenges these idols that the king and everyone else are worshiping. And he basically invites them to this challenge. He says, let's build two altars. I'm going to build one to my God, the God of Elijah. And you can build one to your fakey God over there. And we're going to see which God can call down fire from heaven and light the fire. And whichever God can do it, that's the real God. And the king agrees to this challenge. And so all these people go out into the wilderness to witness this. And they build these two altars so they can do this little experiment, this little competition. And Elijah actually goes one step further by pouring water all over his. So that the only way that it could light is by God's intervention. And at one point, he even taunts the others. Elijah actually says, hey, maybe your God is asleep. Maybe you need to wake him up. Or maybe he's traveling and he needs to come back. No joke, it's really in there. The Old Testament is so funny. And then while the other group is waiting and trying so hard for their idol God to light up the fire on their altar, Elijah's God, our God, rains down fire from heaven to light the altar that Elijah had covered in water, making it clear whose God was the true God. And so Elijah basically humiliates the prophets of this false god and the king by proving who had the real God. And right after this, God brings a powerful rain to the land after years and years of drought and starvation. And God brings the land from a state of death to a state of life. And he used Elijah as his messenger. And so after Elijah essentially humiliates the king in this way, the king threatens to kill him, so he runs for his life. He is now the most hunted man in the land, and he flees. And he runs into the wilderness, into a cave, and he basically prays to God, God, I am so tired just kill me. I want to die. I can't do this anymore. And Elijah falls asleep. And then when he wakes up, there's an angel there who feeds him some food and comforts him. And he's regaining strength, but he's still kind of in this state of despair. And also, pause for a second. I think it's worthy to note that Elijah is in this total state of despair, and God basically prescribes a nap and a snack. So sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap and have a snack. Amen? Okay. But anyway, so the angel leaves, and Elijah still has this profound sense of isolation. And so he travels for 40 days to meet with God. 
And when he gets there, where he's going, there's this great wind, a great earthquake, a great fire, and then silence. I told you, it was very dramatic. And so in the silence, the still small voice of God tells Elijah to go back. To go back to the risk, to go back to the trouble, to the place where he's hunted, and to anoint the person who's going to succeed him as prophet later in life. To anoint Elisha. See, I didn't forget about the friendship part. I didn't get caught too up in the drama. Um, so we're going to pick up this story in the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. It's going to be on the screen behind me. The Lord said to him, to Elijah, go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahala, to succeed you as prophet. And so in the middle of this crazy story, this moment when Elijah is feeling isolated, hunted down, maybe scared, and alone, God calls him to go back and find this person who's supposed to be his successor, his new companion, his protege. And now, often in biblical times, being a prophet is a lonely position. You have to tell people things they do not want to hear. Many prophets in the Bible were unwelcome voices in their time because they proclaimed God's truth when people did not want to hear it. Often, prophets told entire communities that they should turn from their sins and turn to God. And most times in scripture, God trained prophets alone. A lot of times they didn't have a mentor or a friend or a group of prophets they hung out with. Uh, But this time it was different. And God calls Elijah to go find this stranger to join him on this journey. And unsuspecting Elisha has no idea that these two are about to be caught up together in the middle of this dramatic history of what's to become of God's people. So let's keep going down to verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. And then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. So here's something I want us to notice about this point in the story. It cost Elisha something to follow this call. It cost him something to be formed into what God was calling him to be alongside someone else. Elisha had to sacrifice parts of the life he knew in order to allow God to form him into what he was called to be. And so check out what he does in this part of the story. When Elijah finds him, Elisha is plowing in the fields probably like he does most days. And when Elijah anoints him, Elisha takes the oxen he's using for the fields and he slaughters them. And he takes the plow he was using and he burns it for firewood. And then he cooks the meat and he has a goodbye party with his family. And he gives away the rest. And he literally destroyed all the tools he was using for his old livelihood. Because he understood that God had placed a big call on his life. And for Elisha, this meant that he was leaving the comforts of his old life behind. So much so that he slaughtered and burned and said goodbye to most of the components of his life that he had known. And now, am I saying that we should quit our jobs next time we make a new friend? No, I'm absolutely not saying that. 
Uh, but what I am saying is that oftentimes in order for us to allow God to do the transformational work he is going to do in our lives, we need to leave our comfort zones. We can't just do what we've always done and expect the same results. Sometimes we need to be willing to say, okay, God, you want to do some transformational work in me? You want to grow me to be more spiritually mature or a better friend or to be more like Jesus? Okay, then I'm willing to step out of my comfort zone and try a life group. Or I'm willing to stay after church on the patio and connect with new people, or whatever it is that we're being called to do. I'm willing to move beyond the same things I have always known in order to see how God might be ready to change my life. In order for God to do transformational work in our lives, we often have to leave our comfort zones. And so Elisha does. And these two men are brought together, united by God, for a common purpose. And as they journeyed together, Elisha was going to be shaped and formed by God through his new friend and mentor, Elijah, this great prophet. And reading this over the last few weeks have reminded me of a trend I've noticed in my own life. That when God is about to write a new chapter or when God's about to call us to some uncharted waters, often God brings about the friends we need to help form us into the person who's prepared to step into that new call. Sometimes they're friends that just show up for that season and then drift away. Sometimes they're long-term friends who really have a powerful presence in our lives in that season. And, and once in a while, there are seasons where maybe God wants us to learn something alone. But for the most part, there's a trend where God often provides really important friendships to help through different seasons. And maybe that's true for you, too. Often in our lives when God invites us on a new path or a new journey, God also provides us the friends to sustain us on that journey. God sent Elijah to Elisha as part of God's fulfillment of the call that God had on Elisha's life. And God often used friends around, uses friends around us to form us in order to shape our story in the context of God's larger story. A theology professor named Gregory Jones, he wrote this in an article titled Discovering Hope Through Holy Friendships. He wrote, holy friends challenge the sins we have come to love, affirm the gifts we are afraid to claim, and help us dream dreams we otherwise would not dream. And as we hear this quote, I wonder, do you have friends who come to mind? Are there people in your life who will call you out gently when you need to be? Who affirm the gifts that God has given you? Who dream with you and for you? And are we that type of friend to anyone else, to others in our lives? Our friendships are a key way that God forms and disciples us to look more like Jesus. We need friends to walk with us, to pray with us, to cry with us, to rejoice with us, to challenge us. Not because any of our friends are perfect, because they're not going to be. But we are united by our love for one another and our love for God who is perfect. Being a part of a holy friendship is an invitation to grow more into the person God has called us to be. Just as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And so it was with Elijah and Elisha. And now most scholars estimate that Elijah and Elisha were together for somewhere between six and ten years. And unfortunately, the scriptures don't tell us a lot about that period of time. And you may wonder why. Well, most likely, the writer only included the details and the stories that they found to be most important to telling God's history. 
But I'm also going to guess that one of the main reasons is that a lot of their friendship or mentorship was unshockingly ordinary. So we don't hear the everyday ordinary conversations these two prophets had, or the prayers they prayed together, or the meals they shared together, or the difficult times, or the joyful times. But one of the biggest ways we grow our friendships is through everyday, unshockingly ordinary moments. And that's why I said in the beginning, if you feel like you're struggling in the friendship department, there's hope for us. Because God doesn't call us to these grandiose gestures of friendship all the time. We don't have to go on cruises with our friends or buy expensive gifts or do anything crazy to be a good friend. Often the deepest friendships are forged in the most ordinary moments. Talking after church, grabbing a coffee or lunch, a quick text message to let someone know you're thinking or praying for them. Uh, about five years ago, my husband and I went out to dinner with Pastor Ryan and his wife, Hartley. And we'd just been kind of getting to know one another for a couple months. I think this might have been our first dinner out without kids. Between our two families, we have five kids. And uh, I wasn't working here at the church. We'd just been attending for about eight months or so. And over this dinner, we're talking about life and career. And I decided, okay, I'm going to get out of my comfort zone a little bit. I'll be a little vulnerable. And I said, you know... I haven't really told anyone this, but one of my dreams has always been to go to seminary. I'm not sure what I'd do with a seminary degree, but it's just something I've always felt drawn to do. And I didn't know it yet, but God was calling me to do that. And it turns out that Hartley and Ryan would be some of my biggest encouragers along the way. And that seemingly ordinary moment just a couple of friends going out to dinner without kids turned out to be one of the many building blocks in a friendship that has encouraged and challenged me to be more of who God has called me to be over the years. Because God uses our friendships to form us. And so it was with Elijah and Elisha too. And they were together for somewhere between six and ten years. And the scripture tells us a little bit about their life together, but for the most part, it doesn't. And their story wraps up in a truly dramatic fashion, matching the rest of the drama of the story that we've already experienced. And the two friends are walking along together, and they know that Elijah is going to be taken to heaven soon. And Elisha's not super happy about it. And here's where the story picks up in 2 Kings chapter 2. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me. What can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it'll be yours, otherwise it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. And then he took a hold of his garment and tore it in two. And you can really feel the emotion in the way this scene is described. How Elisha tears his garment in two and cries out as his friend leaves him. And immediately what happens next is Elisha picks up Elijah's cloak that had fallen, and Elisha begins to perform miracles and picks up the work of being a prophet right where his mentor had left off. And for chapters and chapters after this, we see Elisha, God use Elisha to bring hope and healing to God's people. Elisha is very clearly a changed person from when we first meet him plowing in the fields to when he becomes God's prophet. And God used another person, a friendship, to shape Elisha into the person he was called to be. And God uses our friendships with others as formative parts of our story to help shape us 
into who we are called to be. And so as we close this morning, I want to take a minute to prayerfully reflect together. So take a few, a few seconds. Feel free to close your eyes if you'd like. You can relax any tension you might be carrying. And let's sit in prayer with God together for a few moments as we reflect on these questions. Who are the holy friendships that you have in your life? And what might God be inviting you to, to deepen the friendships in your life? Maybe this morning you're feeling like you need more friendships in your life. And you're praying for God to bring you good friends who will help you grow. Maybe God's inviting you out of your comfort zone. Maybe to sign up for a six-week life group in our new series coming up. Or to reach out to a friend to connect. Maybe God is bringing to mind a friendship that needs attention. Some quality time or a prayer or an honest conversation. Maybe God is bringing someone to mind who isn't a close friend yet, but who you'd like to spend some more intentional time with. Notice where God might be inviting or nudging you this morning. God, wherever we find ourselves with the friendships in our lives this morning, I pray that you would encourage us. We know, God, that you care about us deeply and the friendships in our lives. So God, would you continue to use the holy friendships in our lives to help us become more of the women and men that you have made us to be? If you're nudging us to get out of our comfort zones, God, would you give us the strength and the encouragement to do so? If we have a relationship that needs reconciliation, would you guide us and give us wisdom and peace? And if we're praying for good friendships in our lives, would you provide the community we need, Lord? We thank you, God, that you are always forming us, always present with us, always loving us. In Jesus' name.